Thanks so much, Gray and Dick, for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to hear more about the Living New Deal site. Um, we use it a lot here at Swan. Uh, well, I'm south from, from Swan. I'm here in New Jersey tonight. Uh, but uh, uh, so uh, I'd like to jump right in and give uh, Gray and, and Dick time to speak. They've prepared some great information for us. So uh, Gray, start us off. Tell us about uh, the founding of the Living New Deal. Well, thank you all for and to Alex. Um, I just wanted to say that this all started when I was an undergraduate at the University of California, Berkeley uh, in 1967. Because up in the hills, there is this wonderful rose garden. It's a great amphitheater of roses with tennis courts beyond it. And um, I was intrigued by this because there's a plaque there if you look for it. And it says, constructed by Works Progress Administration, 1937. And I was wondering why the government would go to all this trouble to create a place that is simply beautiful, as well as those tennis courts, which are recreational. And in 1999, I published two books, one my dissertation, Imperial San Francisco, and the other uh, collaboration with a photographer, Farewell Promised Land. I had been an environmental writer for about 20 years. And, um, and I just realized after publishing this that I had to find something uh, that was more upbeat and better for my mental health than doing environmental writing. And so I was floundering around for a few years looking for something to do. And I had been intrigued by all these WPA plaques and markers that you're about to see. But it also occurred to me that so much of the infrastructure that's all around us and that we take for granted came from that period as well too, like the Bay Bridge. And also right under our feet, sewers and storm drains like these ones in Los Angeles that made possible urban sprawl in the LA basin and everywhere else for that matter. But even just curbs and sidewalks would have these WPA markers on them. So what's this all about? I thought I'd write a book on it, but then I fell down the New Deal rabbit hole. And what that's all about, it happens to almost all, all of us who get involved in this, is most people have heard of the WPA, but there are so many other alphabet soup agencies and all of these left stuff behind, like shells on the beach. And thank God they did. One of the things that had intrigued me in particular is uh, New Deal murals and post offices, which I thought were WPA. They're not, they're from another art project. Um, and I was actually trained as an art historian in the 1970s before I saw the light and went to geography. So I was wondering, well, why did they put all this artwork in post offices? Many of the post offices themselves happen to be New Deal too. Some of these are enormous, like the main post office in St. Louis. This is a little one in Hyde Park, New York, and it's the only picture of the man who's responsible for all of this, Franklin Roosevelt, who lived just a couple miles down the road. And there he is with some of his neighbors, as well as some of his um, officials from the New Deal. And of course, Fala, his favorite dog, his Scotty, it's not just that there are murals, there are also wonderful sculptures on many of these post offices, such as this Western cowboy receiving his mail um, on a saguaro uh, cactus in Arizona, apparently, that's in Philadelphia. So gradually what happened is that I realized the lost world was emerging and it was ours. My own parents' generation built it, they just forgot to tell us about it. And perhaps they didn't even know themselves. It also occurred to me that these projects, if they haven't been demolished, are still being actively used. Um, and many of the people who are using them have absolutely no idea where they came from or whom they should thank. And that's why when I began the project, I decided to call it the Living New Deal. I didn't want to have photographs of empty projects. I wanted them full of the people who are using them. This is not an elegy like my book, Farewell Promised Land. It's quite the opposite. And then I ran into this guy, Harvey Smith, um, who had kind of the same idea 
at the same time. And what we did, well, we started forming an organization called the Living New Deal. Here's Harvey actually giving a tour of WPA stables in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And we began forming a volunteer organization to try to locate and map these projects. I got to do what I like to do the best, which is just do archival research. Here I am at the FDR library in Hyde Park, going through their records. And then we have a sister organization, which I went on the board of for a while. This is um, the National New Deal Preservation Association of, of uh, New Mexico. And here we are touring the FDR Memorial. Harvey's in the back. He was the president of it. And I just fell in love with this guy. Um, uh, as practically everybody who has gotten into our project, and even some who haven't, have as well too. In the process, I've met some absolutely wonderful people, such as elderly people who knew Franklin Roosevelt or whose lives were immensely um, uh, refreshed, saved actually, their families were saved, and um, they were enlightened by many of the New Deal projects. This is a, one of the CCC boys, as they were called at the time, Walter Atwood. Um, and here he is with one of the statues of the CCC boys. And this is at the Library of Congress. The woman on the left is Gertrude Goodrich. She was one of the last of the surviving New Deal artists. Um, the one in the middle is, um, and now I'm just blanking, um, he is one of the federal writer projects uh, survivors. And the one on the left is Ellie Seagraves. She is the granddaughter of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And we were commemorating one of the anniversaries of the uh, New Deal. And I'm so sorry, I can't remember the name of the man in the middle because he was a remarkable character who actually discovered Zora Neale Hurston um, when, writing a, when working on the Federal Writers Project. In the process, I have um, discovered some absolutely wonderful works of art. This is a mural by Philip Guston and Reuben Kadish at a tuberculosis asylum in Southern California. But these murals run from the almost sort of naive, such as this one by Melat Dean in um, uh, Sebastopol, to ones that are kind of lusty, like this one in the Napa Valley. The point of all of this is we're mapping what the New Deal left us. Um, and uh, it's never been done before. This is a map of just some of the projects that the Public Works Administration under Harold Ickes did. And it just shows that the nation was absolutely transformed within only about 10 years by all of these projects. This is just one of the agencies. There's so much more than this. And so that's why I liken it to an archeological project. When Harold Ickes, who was in charge of PWA, came to California to de dedicate the Friant Dam, he said, even those of us in Washington who are responsible for carrying out orders sometimes lack comprehension of the mighty sweep of this program. That's true. No record, no complete record was ever kept. And so that's what we're doing. We're trying to reconstruct it after the fact. Now, as I said, it was a volunteer organization. It was like herding cats and I am anything but an administrator. And so fortunately, this guy stepped in and saved my bacon. Um, it's Dick Walker. He had been my dissertation advisor, although we're about the same age. And Dick is the administrator that I am not. He began building the new Living New Deal as a real organization with paid staff and national associates. And it's just been growing for about the last 10 years since Dick came on board. We also have national associates all around the country. These are two of our real stalwarts working at the National Archives, um, capturing some of this stuff. And you can become a national associate too. If you know anything about the New Deal, please get in touch with us if we don't have something on our map. So, we're forging ahead with the Living New Deal 
AW, that is after Walker. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dick right now, and he'll tell you about how the project has actually progressed over the years since he came on board. Thanks very much. All right. Um, I hope, oops. Uh, Grant, you need to stop sharing your screen. Oh, sorry. Turn that off. Hello, everyone. I see a lot of friendly uh, names, names of friends, uh, people checked in. Okay, now I can do mine. And uh, it's wonderful. I've got, gosh, Annie Sagan and Fern Nesson, Chuck Sweeney. And this is what I wanted. I hope it's showing up. Okay. Um, Peggy Crane, let's see my brother, Dana Walker, Ch Sally Burke, Mike Hyman, my goodness. Uh, it's lovely to have you all here and all the rest of you. And thanks very much uh, for the invitation from Harold to speak to you tonight. So <clears throat> I'm gonna be a little more uh, down to earth about what um, our project looks like, how it works so that I hope that uh, many of you can take advantage of the material we have to offer. So, all right, this is what I'm gonna go through, talk a bit about us and our website and our maps, how to use our map and give you a few examples of some New Deal sites that are on our map. <clears throat> so we'll start with our mission, which is, as Gray said, is to map uh, New Deal public works and artworks across the country, and, but also to educate uh, the American public about the New Deal because, as you know, Americans' memory is very short. And there's been enormous efforts over the years to erase the memory of the New Deal and what it did. And I'll come back to that a bit later on. So we also, then promote the New Deal as a model with many useful lessons for today's public policy uh, when we can. And there was a moment there in the last year where things looked very good and quite a bit got done, but uh, this country could do a lot more. And of course, the great thing about the New Deal is it, it's the proof that we can do it because we did it before. So this is Gray's theme. I love to use this slide, Unearthing a Lost Civilization. We are the leader for the New Deal. You see that in the Mayan ruins, you see a few prominent buildings, but once you put leader on those forests, all of a sudden you see entire cities that have disappeared beneath the trees and the soil. So no, New Deal public works were never entirely documented or compiled. The coming of World War II meant that uh, things had to shut down very quickly and there were no thorough final reports for anything. PWA was the best, but as Gray said, all these agencies and they never, they never did much in the way of compiling. And the worst are WPA and the CCC in a way, which did the most small projects. Okay, and we're, <clears throat> as part of our um, educational work and research work is we document sites, New Deal public works, material sites. Unfortunately, we have to leave out things like sewing rooms and a lot of school milk programs and so on that don't, uh, simply don't show up as spots on the map. But with public works and material works, there's a lot that still remain, a huge number, perhaps the majority, and uh, you can really point to where they are or where they just were. So we do this through a huge database which produces an online map, which I'll talk about much more. Uh, we do a lot of educational outreach. We do exhibits, we do, there's Gray leading a tour. We do conferences, that was our conference on women in the New Deal. We run webinars regularly and we write articles and and so on and so on. We've put out an enormous amount of information and try and reach the widest public as possible. And finally, we try to push for public policy. Now, this is my didactic page. So I will not belabor it, 
except to say that uh, this is what the New Deal did and Americans darn well ought to know it. And most of them do not. That it saved the economy and capitalism. It completed the modernization of this country when much of it was unbelievably back, backward. It improved the lives of ordinary people in all kinds of absolutely essential ways. Everyone knows about social security, but they don't know about all the parks, the schools, the food programs, you know, food stamps started with the New Deal, minimum wages started with the New Deal, and so on and so on and so on. The New Deal also saved American democracy because there were a lot of calls from the fascist right and extreme left at the time to replace liberal democracy. As you know, in Europe and other countries, it did not survive uh, the crisis of the Great Depression. And Roosevelt and his team's action and then actually action for the people and with the people. It's public participation in so many of these work relief programs and other educational programs and so on that made Americans feel that government was working for them, but also working with them. And the evidence was everywhere because the New Deal transformed the entire country. You can go anywhere in the country, virtually any county, all 3,000 in some counties, any county seat, uh, rural areas, and you will find the evidence of New Deal buildings, New Deal uh, artworks, New Deal um, uh, land erosion projects, timber planting projects, and so on. Dams, electrification. It's quite incredible. And it's everywhere. It was a universal program in very essential ways. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. I want to talk about what we have on offer. We have a website that is the center, kind of the public uh, entry point into the Living New Deal. It gets about a million, over a million visits a year, has about 50 sections and a thousand pages of content, which means there's an enormous amount there. And even Gray tells me periodically, you know, I went on our website, I couldn't believe the stuff I found. And that's a kind of uh, regular uh, commentary after people go on our website and search around. <clears throat> so please avail yourself of it. Um, the purpose of it is to be our friend, face and to be a clearinghouse for knowledge and information on the New Deal. There I give conveniently the URL that you can just Google, anyone can Google Living New Deal and up pops our website right at the top. In fact, on many Google searches on New Deal, we pop up at the top as well. So our website is a central part and uh, whoops, and I went backwards. It has several sections and I don't wanna bore you to death, but uh, you kind of scroll down on that homepage and you'll find a section that tells you, uh, leads you to our map, leads you to what we, things we've added to the map, where you can find our print maps, which I will speak about in a moment, and so on, and how to find your city or your state and the New Deal projects that we've uncovered in those places. We have a news section that, uh, as well as an excellent newsletter, comes out once a month. Please get on our mailing list. It's very easy to do. Just go on the website and click. And uh, this is where we feature a lot of our newest articles about New Deal history, public policy, discoveries of New Deal artworks that have been lost, and so on, and much more. We have a resources section that's enormous about New Deal history, uh, New Deal videos and audios from the past and the present of people speaking from the New Deal or about the New Deal, films about that, some original New Deal films, that we had reworked so the quality is, is quite serviceable. Um, and then we have things like curricula for teachers, bibliographies, video, videos of all kinds, and special, special sections like the New Deal worked here, showed here, and links and so on. And this I, on the right hand uh, of your screen, you can see just one little section called New Deal programs. Well, we discovered 
Brent McKee did this, one of our staffers uh, over the years. And we went from maybe 20 New Deal programs that most people might recognize to discovering that there's upwards of 100 that you can identify. And people just don't know. <clears throat> so uh, then the Get Involved section at the bottom, we ask people to submit family histories, to submit sites. It's a crowdsourced project. So it's not just my small staff of six to eight people, depending on the time period, but we have a national associates group of over 50 people, and we have other volunteers who submit sites, and anybody can do it. You just get our app, or you just submit the information through our website. And you can find events here, you can make comments. People make wonderful comments like, my grandfather laid the bricks for this post office that are quite refreshing. And uh, so that's uh, something to look at. We are redesigning the website because it's so comp become so complicated with pull down menus that a lot of people um, can't find their way around it. So we're now creating a a system led by simply by pictures, and there'll be several layers. You just click through the pictures. But this is a huge project, and we have to redesign our WordPress uh, website fat framework. That's an enormous project and won't be done for several months. All right, uh, the kind of maps we have, we have several kinds of maps. Uh, there's the essential online large map, the national map, and I show here, our, when we first went national, back in about 2010, 2011, that was our first national map there. And you can see a few sites. Most of it was in California where we started. And then upper right, you see 2015 when we hit 10,000 sites. We were still on Google Maps then. Then we changed our map base because Google Maps, you get all that commercial junk. And we didn't want that, so we went to uh, Mapbox, which is another online program you can use, open platform. And we now have over 17,700 sites. We can also, you can go in, you can find projects by state and city. You can find your state, you click on your state, and it opens up to a list of all the cities we've got any site in, so you can find your city, or you can just do a simple search. You can just say Poughkeepsie, New York in the search. Uh, the search query is right up here in the corner, which I cut off inconveniently. We also have state pages <coughs> for about half the states now. We want to complete all those. And if you click on those, you get something like this Oregon state page, where the map of Oregon is isolated. So that way you don't have to fuss around and go right to Oregon, find out what's new in Oregon. All right. We do pocket maps. These are posters that are 18 by 26 or so. You can fold them up, they go in your, your pocket or your purse, very convenient. We started with a small one of San Francisco. We've now done very large ones of New York and Washington, DC. We're working hard to do one on Los Angeles in the coming couple years, if we can get funding. And then we hope to do other cities and also counties, rural counties, because if you look typical rural county, there are dozens and dozens of New Deal sites, which the people there, which who tend to be conservative these days, uh, don't even don't know about. But in cities, people don't know either. Here's a look at what our Washington DC map looks like. That's of course much larger in person. And you have a big map, you have a walking map of the area around the mall. You have a little um, thumbnail pictures of key sites which are then described on the back of the map along with some basic information about us and the New Deal. You can order those on our website. Now using the map, so I wanna give you a little tutorial here uh, in the few minutes that I have to remain. Um, if you look, that's the way the map actually looks when it comes up on your computer. Um, if you have a laptop and there's an information panel, you can, there's a help button if you wanna find out how to use it. 
You can close it with that little X. You can do simple searches of places, and then you can do complex searches by categories and agencies that highlight. In other words, you can look for all CCC campgrounds and all the other dots will disappear and there will only be the CC campground dots. And then um, you can geolocate locate yourself up in the upper right hand corner, you see buttons, you hit that top one and it, it'll zoom in to where you are if you give it permission and so on. And this is how you zoom, when you zoom in, this is what you see. Zooming into Washington DC, for example, you see the dots become more numerous and clearer, then they become icons. And those icons signify whether it's an artwork or an infrastructure work or what, whatever, a, a park. And we have about 10 categories. And then you zoom in even closer, that's about the level of a geolocate zoom, if you locate yourself. And you can see the mall area in DC and the icons very clearly. Then you click on that icon, on any of the icons. In this case, I clicked on the Federal Trade Commission building in DC, which is at the point of the Federal Triangle. Up comes the pop-up in, in that sliding uh, panel, up it comes the Federal Trade Commission. In this case, there's the building and the sculptures by Lance. And then you see at the bottom of that, you can click and get full project information, <clears throat> uh, which I'll show you in the next picture. Up comes a full project page with all the information we have about who did it, when it was done, uh, who, who uh, commissioned the artwork, for example. In this case, it was a Treasury Section of Fine Arts. There were many art programs, as you may or may not know. On the right-hand column, you can see other related um, projects at that same site. In other words, the artworks in this case uh, and the building itself. And that's what we have. And in some cases, we have a lot of information. Other cases, not so much. <clears throat> now, our map is also on phones, smartphones, iPhones, and other Google phones. And we have an app. We now have an iPhone app, which you can download for free from the App Store. And when you look at the map on the phone, that's kind of what it looks like on my narrow gauge phone. And there's that same sliding panel, only it pops up from the bottom. You know, you get that little triangle and up it comes. And all the other principles are the same. And then if you get our app, that's what we use for crowdsourcing. You can send photos, information, videos, whatever to us to vet and then put into the database. And uh, if you click on that line that says, see all sites on the national map, up comes the other map there. So that's very convenient to have and is very helpful if you want to send us any information. Now I'm gonna give you a sampling of a few sites to wrap up here. Um, I just put a list of agencies for no particular reason, but people get very confused. Uh, everybody thinks almost everything's the WPA, but it's not. The Public Works Administration paid for most of the big buildings. Treasury paid for post offices and federal buildings. WPA did a lot, it was a relief agency and did small buildings and parks and sidewalks and gutters and so on. CCC worked in mostly in the out of doors, that is in the, for the Forest Service with the National Park Service, for state parks and improved parks all over the country. CWA was short lived, uh, the NWA was under, was National Youth Administration and so on and so on. But these are the names that constantly pop up. <laughs> Now, just starting in New York, the public library, NERPS is a typical site. So there's the public library. You can't see me moving my little arrow, can you? I don't think so. Well, maybe you can. But since there's no. Oh, good. I can go. It's right down in here. I think actually the sign for it is there. I clicked on that. And up comes the panel. Then you click on full project information. You get this page. 
And then uh, I can't show the scrolls. You scroll down, but here we are. The bottom part of the page is a gallery of photographs. You click on any of those photographs and up comes the full photo with the information who took it. We try to take a lot of our own. Um, in other cases, we have to use uh, the post office department's photographer or occasionally Wikipedia, but we try as much as possible to source our own photos and verify information through newspapers, old newspapers, reports, um, HABs reports, whatever we can get our hands on. Sometimes there are plaques, but most New Deal sites are not marked um, or the plaque is very obscure. So um, it, it's hard to find them often. You can go, sometimes there's a cornerstone, but that's not so common either. That's mostly on post offices and large federal government. Triborough Bridge, <clears throat> right out there in the middle of the water. And uh, there's its little panel. And then up comes the, pa the page. Uh, as we know, as you New Yorkers know, it's not called Triborough anymore officially, but I don't know that anybody uses RFK Bridge. And then when you scroll down, you hit the fact that we were hacked in 2000, late 2020, right before the election, undoubtedly politically motivated because we do have like a new sections on the Green New Deal and so on. And it took out 35,000 photographs. And we were able to restore immediately about 30,000 of those, but there's still thousands missing. We've hundreds of hours of staff time, volunteer time have gone into doing this. When I went to Triborough Bridge for this talk, I was very unhappy to discover that all, this, all the photographs on that except one seem to be eliminated. So if you see that, if you see a site with images missing, feel free to drop us a note to info. We have a, a standard email, info at livingnewdeal.org and tell us. And we'll try to track it down. It's impossible to go through all 17,500 sites and get them all right immediately. Here's another site. I didn't show the, uh, the project, um, the panel, but when you go to a search directly for the Udall Department of Interior, you get three pages, 10 of 10, 10 items each that are all separate items in the Department of Interior in Washington with the building and all the artworks. There's 50 murals and artworks in the Department of Interior and we have at least 30, but I think and sometimes they're joined. So we have about 40 of them on our site with some excellent photographs. Some taken by you, yours truly. <clears throat> Here's a more humble site. I just went to and poked something in Minnesota. Uh, uh, a little dot in Minnesota. It's a machinery museum that used to be a school. Minimal, minimal information, one photograph from the museum itself. But that's the kind of thing you see everywhere. Here's another one like that, a post office and its mural in Gillespie, Illinois. And this is one I love. So to go to another part of the country in the Southwest down near Tucson, Colossal Cave National Monument. That unbelievably beautiful stone visitor center is built by the CCC. Post offices were treasury department. <clears throat> Some of these projects, a lot of artworks or WPA um, federal art project, but not all. People think they're all, but they're not. And CCC did some magnificent work. Here's the most magnificent of all the WPA uh, sites, Timberline Lodge on Mount Hood in Oregon, where there are all kinds of paintings, mosaics, furniture, um, textiles. They did everything. It was a showpiece for the Northwestern WPA and well worth a look if you have a minute because it's magnificent. And then I have to finish on this. Uh, Ronald Reagan Airport, National Airport, in uh, Washington, D.C. National Airport, the original terminal, which we show there, is a PWA project. The whole airport was built with FDR's intervention to get the damn thing built because they were 
debating it to death. <clears throat> there had been an old airport, little airport by Arlington Cemetery. So they did the fill, they put in the airport and they built that beautiful terminal building. And then ironically they named it after Ray, Ronald Reagan, who of course turned out to be a great enemy of the New Deal, but whose father, like Dick Cheney's father, was saved by working for the WPA. And Reagan was originally a New Deal Democrat. Ah, the ironies of history. <coughs> so here, <coughs> excuse me, is what you can do. You can order our maps, you can look at our website, you can submit site information, volunteer, become one of our volunteers if you want, or more, or donate if you wish. And that's the Living New Deal, and thank you for listening. And sorry for the frog in my throat. So I stopped my screen share so we can all Great. talk. And uh, Gray, I'm gonna hand it off back to you <clears throat> because you wanted to speak a little more before we wrap things up. Um, is that, am I remembering correctly? Absolutely, yes. Fantastic, okay, so have at it. Sorry, I slopped over a little Gray. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Um, let's see. And I'll just add, uh, Susan Ives, uh, one of your, your team was answering some questions in the Q and A while you were speaking. That was oh, good. wonderful. Thank, Thank you, Susan. Susan. All right. Okay, I'm just going to do a short talk um, the, on the subject about the New Deal that has begun to interest me the most after studying it for well over 10 years, and that is the ethics behind the New Deal. As I said, um, and as Dick also said, it turns out it is like a lost civilization. It's just that it's ours. And before I go on, I should say that that gentleman whose name I couldn't remember is Stetson Kennedy. And... Um, I'm so ashamed that I couldn't remember his name because he was a really phenomenal person um, who went undercover with the KKK. Um, he was just a great guy and it was a privilege to know him. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about this lost civilization. It is like a great archeological dig, a WPA archeological dig. Archeology span itself as a science, as a profession made a quantum leap forward during that time, I recently wrote an article about this. And Roosevelt didn't just do this on his own, although of course he had enormous charisma and you knew how to use his voice, his, um, his um, speech writing, which he wrote magnificent speeches and his charisma, um, but he also had help. He had an amazing array of people around him that he selected largely, but above all, his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, always sort of pushing him to do more, to become more progressive. The two of them were a team. We really had a twofer at that time. And I give her at least as much credit as I do her husband, although he was the one who actually had to do the administrative work, of course. She was always whispering, sometimes shouting in his ear, now, this, of all those New Dealers, this is perhaps the most important, Harry Hopkins. Um, Harry had worked in a settlement house early on. He was a graduate of Grinnell College. He went to New York City, worked in the Cristadora Settlement House, as did so many of these New Dealers, including Eleanor Roosevelt, who worked at the Rivington Street Settlement in the Lower East Side. Harry, would have agreed with Lillian Wald, who was the founder of the Henry Street Settlement, which is still going strong in the Lower East Side. And I urge you all to visit the museum there. It is a museum as much about what the settlement houses were about as about specifically the Henry Street Settlement. And what Lillian Wald said is absolutely true for the New Deal. Um, it was a systemic approach to societal ills to try to cure them. It wasn't just building public works. 
I'll come back to that in a moment. Roosevelt said in his second inaugural address, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to those, the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. And that I think is a fundamentally Christian statement. And the point is that the Roosevelt's, both of them were practicing rather than professing Christians. They believed that it was their duty to help those less fortunate as did the people around them, such as Francis Perkins, Harry Hopkins, and the others. This is a book by John Ruskin that I found in the Roosevelt Library in Hyde Park. It's called Sesame and Lilies by John Ruskin. Eleanor Roosevelt gave this to her husband. She wanted him to read it. And inside I found marginalia and underwriting. And among them was practical Christianity, only of value with practical underlined. Now, I took this to the librarian. I said, is this Franklin Roosevelt's writing? He said, sure looks like it. So I don't know where he found the time to read this in his rather busy life, but I think it's telling if he actually did and made this comment. Because I become very interested in the influence of the 19th century prophet, John Ruskin on the New Deal via the settlement house movement right in between at the turn of the century, which he did so much to inspire. So when we look at something like Red Rock Amphitheater outside of Denver, we're looking at one of many New Deal public works where Americans were supposed to come together as a community, but we're also looking at something else. We're looking at the lost ethical language of New Deal public works, a language that we have been persuaded to forget over at least the last 40 years. And among that, in that language, of course, is art. And so I thought I'd wrap up because the audience here, I presume, is largely interested in New Deal arts. Um, this statement at the Henry Street Settlement that arts are an essential human experience. Of course, that was one of John Ruskin's main points. And Holger Cahill, who was the um, head of the WPA Art Project, said that FDR was more deeply interested in the arts than any other president since Thomas Jefferson. And it is doubtful that any head of state since the Renaissance has equaled him as a patron of living art. And that art is all over the country. We have a continent spanning art gallery in our post offices, federal buildings, and schools, unfortunately, the schools are almost impossible to get into anymore. But um, he left behind an enormous legacy of art. And that included the WPA art schools, such as this one in San Francisco, where very young children were gotten started early on to become practicing artists, or at least to integrate art into their life. And this WPA art school in Tallahassee. Crafts were very important. And again, I think that derives from John Ruskin's advocacy in the mid 19th century to late 19th century. And here you can see the complete crossover between the WPA and the Henry Street settlement where so many of these classes were held. And that was true of other settlement houses as well. So here you see a WPA group of women making dolls, mannequins for educational purposes. You can see it's multiracial and this might be one of them. This actually happened <laughs> in the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History, which doubles as Los Angeles City Museum. And it's a WPA doll, perhaps made by those women you just saw. I'm gonna wrap up by saying that as Dick said, we have on the Living New Deal website, um, a section of over 100 uh, New Deal movies, which we got from the National um, Archives, and Brent, Brent McKee got them for us. One of my favorites is just called Hands. It's five minutes long, it's soundless, and it just shows what hands can and should do to bring a country out of a financial crisis, such as the Great Depression, but many other things as well, too. And they are, of course, critical to arts and crafts, but to so much more. In the National Archives, in the WPA records, I found a series of cards, which I think are studies for this movie. So I'm just going to show them to you in closing. 
hands. Weaving, potting, stained glass, braille. And my favorite is this of the hands of two elderly women, white and black, working together. And that I think was what the New Dealers hoped to accomplish, to make the United States the community that it aspires to, but has so often failed to do. And I think they were making a good start on it. So I just wanted to thank you. Um, and I want to thank Swan in particular for hosting us. And I hope that you've learned a little bit more about the New Deal, as well as our own project, the Living New Deal. And thank you so much, Harold and, and Alex, for having us. It's such a pleasure to have both of you. Yes. Uh, that was a great thank presentation. You. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Alex, great. would you, you like to unshare your screen? Oh, yes. <laughs> thank you. Ray's <laughs> really into sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it was so wonderful to have you both. Uh, it was great to hear more about this organization. And I'm like, just itching to go search Hudson, Hudson County, New Jersey, um, and see what I come up with. <laughs> um, I also just wanted to give a quick shout out to the chat because I'm pretty sure this talk is going to result in an Upper West Siders New Deal Club. Um, and uh, <laughs> that transitions us nicely to the Q&A where we, we had a couple of great questions come in. Um, and one of them was, is the New York City map available? Uh, somebody said it was sold out. Will it be available again? Um, I think um, it, it will be available again. We have a temporary uh, supply chokehold. You know how the times are. <laughs> but um, it'll be available soon again, not to worry. Wonderful. Let us know, because I think that might be a hot item at SWAN. Absolutely. Um, and also, <laughs> as uh, Peggy Crane said on the uh, chat, the New York City L Living New Deal chapter is very much alive and well and active. So uh, I don't know if you want to do an Upper West Side Club or an Upper East Side Club, but also, Think about joining with that chapter and contacting Peggy. It's all the boroughs. One, one chapter per borough, uh, that may be too much. That would be a lot to manage, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so one of the questions we got in was from Joy, who was wondering, um, and it, it, it fits nicely with what Gray was talking about with the art. Um, that a lot of the New Deal art is super recognizable. Like immediately you just look at it and you're like, oh, this is from that era. Um, and I, I think they're wondering why, why is it so immediately recognizable? What, what contributes to that in, incredible stylized um, vibe for lack of a better word? Harold, I'm sure you have a better word for that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would say there's several factors. Uh, a lot of these students were studying at the Pennsylvania Academy, the Art Students League, the uh, 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 um, the Institute of Art in Chicago. So there were certain think tanks and and professors of the Ashcan era that were the teachers of these these people. John Stuart Curry. Uh, you know, this older generation was teaching these younger artists. So stylistically, it is of the period. Uh, when you see a lot of the uh, bas reliefs, uh, I think a lot of the artists were having to look to history. So they were looking at Greek, Roman, and Egyptian relief work. So a lot of it is very rigid, like uh, late Egyptian work. And um, so I think, uh, there's a lot of variation in there, but I do see Joy's point that it, it does seem to uh, look similar when you go from one post office to the next. And I think it's because of, of what, what resources they had at that time. Looking at Diego Rivera, who, who went to Europe and looked at the frescoes uh, in, in Europe, uh, because working in fresco, I'm sure for the American artist was quite a challenge. Uh, fresco is not an easy thing to work in. 
you're, you're laying plaster, working into the wet plaster. You can only work in a small section before it dries. You have to plan it out on a large scale. Uh, so they had to look at uh, works that came before them. And I want to make a point about mm -hmm. um, policy, that there was no art policy, central art policy or architectural policy. So there were the styles that were popular at the time, but it varied enormously. And in, you know, some artworks were commissioned. And so, you know, you had panels of judges, but in a lot of cases where the, um, the make work art project, the relief art projects, uh, the artist had pretty much free reign. So it varies all over the map. And in architecture, clearly modern deco was the, was the dominant type, but you have all these federalist post offices out in the West, we have all these mission revival and Pueblo style and God knows what all. I mean, it was pretty much whatever it went and a lot of it was regionalized. And I think the last thing about the art styles too is the American scene painting was very popular. So a lot of post office murals are local history and local scenes and very much have that look. Uh, uh, kind of, you know, very local and as Gray said, you know, almost naive sometimes. But um, the part of that art that interests me the most is the social realism. And so we, we can't ignore the enormous um, influence of the Mexican muralists, which the administrators of these various art projects, they were looking at Mexico and government patronage of the, um, of the three great muralists, but particularly Diego Rivera, who had an enormous impact on American um, artists of the New Deal, especially in San Francisco, uh, where you can see a lot of social realism just obviously influenced by Diego Rivera. And of course, if you go to the parks, you always have National Park rustic style, which has its own history. It goes all the way back to uh, you know, sort of English to Ruskin and whatnot, but what was very became quite standardized within the parks, and you can spot that stuff a mile away. CCC mostly. Yeah, that was that was really um, a revival of the arts and crafts about twenty years after it was supposed to have died, and there was an architect who graduated from Cal, U UC, a Herbert Mayer, who was largely responsible for that um, because he had tremendous influence and he did a, a sort of pattern book for what buildings in national and state parks should look like. And his daughter here in Berkeley is a good friend of mine. I, we got another question and I think this is might, might be the last one we have time for this, this evening, but um, Alan asked about the possibility of a new New Deal and you both alluded to this a little bit in your, your talks. Um, do we think this is a thing that could happen now? And, and what would your hopes be for a 2.0 New Deal? Our hopes would be probably far too high, <laughs> given the way where this country is now. We did have a pretty, um, a pretty upbeat moment there after the 2020 election. And even before that, after the 2018 election, when the talk of the Green New Deal. And it's very fortunate, I think, and very apt that um, the activists around climate change chose the Green New Deal as their slogan, um, because the New Deal was so much more than just conservation. It was conservation with concern for both the land and the people. And it's such a vast array of of projects. And I'll just say that on our website, we have a section on the Green New Deal that has papers on uh, various uh, aspects of the New Deal, including of the Green New Deal, including uh, a bit on the conservation efforts of the New Deal. We have a webinar on the CCC and conservation. And I wrote a paper there, a rather long one, about how the New Deal today would translate into a Green New Deal if anyone's interested. Beyond that, I won't get into the politics of the prospects right now, which are, I've been, uh, I'm afraid I'm more pessimistic than I was a year ago. 
that's perhaps safest. Um, I uh, thank you both so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge uh, with us this evening. Harold, I'm getting one request. Um, and I don't think we, we have quite enough time to get really into it. But can you tell us just a little bit about the auction this week? Sure. Uh, well, it's it's quite diverse. We have prints. We have uh, um, we have uh, prints. We have paintings. We have drawings. We have mural studies, photography. Uh, we have uh, Gray. You uh, do you know of the museum expansion project? We have dioramas that were made of Native American life. Uh, and we have uh, four of those, and we, we're selling them as two different lots, uh, so a grouping of two really interesting works. Um, and uh, you feel how diverse the, the, the New Deal was uh, in the range of things that were being done, uh, projects and uh, multimedia and places for people to make prints and places for people to learn trades and, and develop their skills. So. Um, yeah, go to our website and look at the, the sale. It's, it's not just uh, an auction catalog. It's really a learning tool. You, uh, uh, our team wrote uh, information on almost every single lot. So you can read about where that artist participated, what they, what they did in the programs. Uh, it's, a, it's a learning tool. I, I, uh, on a personal level, I think a really fun thing about these catalogs has been, and just n learning more through SWAN about the New Deal, is that it offered opportunities for women, Black artists, artists of color, and um, I see somebody saying hard to afford the item plus the premium. Yes, auctions can be painful. Um, but there are actually a variety of prices, um, price ranges in the sale. And some of the work from like the prints, especially, uh, can be very attainable. Um, so that's just my little pitch. But aside from bidding, like it's free to browse our website and it's also free uh, at the expense of Harold's time to send him questions about individual items. Um, and I'm sure he welcomes those. The preview is also open in New York. Uh, tomorrow and Wednesday from 12 to 5 p.m. Uh, and we are thrilled to be able to put up a public exhibition. Um, finally, one question I got was about recording. We will have a recording of this available. Uh, we will not have it available immediately after this program ends, but um, we will share it via email tomorrow or Wednesday um, and also on social media. So follow us at Swan Galleries, Twitter, Instagram, Etc. Um, I and think follow that's us at livingnewdeal.org. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Join us, become a volunteer, please. It's like a magnificent scavenger hunt. And it's a lot of fun, and we have a great group of people. So please join us if you feel so moved. I, I love seeing the passion in the chat is just so evident sometimes when we partner with an organization like yours where you're the folks you bring um, are really here for the, your topic. And I love that. It's just so cool. Gray, Dick, thank you so much for your time. Harold, thank you for putting this together. This is a really fun one. My pleasure. Um, Thanks, everyone. Everybody stay safe. Uh, and we will see you at the next Swan Salon. Have a great evening.